Hi, I'm Father Chris Ayler of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to another episode of Living Divine Mercy. You know, as Catholics, one of the most common things we hear is people saying, purgatory doesn't exist. Now, seeing that we are approaching the month of November, and especially in the first week of that month, we honor our faithful departed, our loved ones who have passed away before us, and learning how we can help them. And what is purgatory, and why is it needed for many to be able to get to heaven? That's what we're going to talk about today, so please stay with us. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines purgatory not just as a punishment, but as purification, so as to achieve the holiness necessary for one to enter the joy of heaven. And paragraph 1030 tells us that purgatory is experienced by those who die in God's grace and friendship, meaning they are not in mortal sin, but who are still in need of being purified. Uh-oh. Sounds like most of us. <laughs> so the Catholic doctrine of purgatory, which is not man-made but based in Scripture, makes sense since the Bible says purification is necessary. As Revelation 21, 27 teaches, nothing unclean will enter the presence of God in heaven. So even if we die with our mortal sins forgiven, there can still be many impurities in us, specifically venial sins or the temporal punishment due to sins already forgiven. You know, 1 John 5, 16 tells us that some sin is deadly and some sin is not deadly. And those deadly sins, or mortal sins as we call them, can cause the loss of our soul if we die with those sins without repenting. But what about those frustrating venial sins that aren't deadly, such as impatience, bending the truth, or not obeying all the laws? Those need to be cleansed as well before heaven. So praise God, if it wasn't for purgatory, we could easily be damned. Therefore, unless you are perfect, you better hope purgatory exists. <laughs> you know, while few of us are so rotten that we deserve to automatically go to hell, at the same time, so few of us are so perfect enough that we deserve to go straight into heaven without any repairs. So purgatory is actually a mercy of God. Now, some will say, but Jesus died for my sins and there's nothing I need to do now. Yes, that's true. Jesus died for all of humanity as all people have been redeemed by Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. But not all of humanity will be saved. Jesus won that grace for our salvation on the cross. But we need to fully cooperate with that grace, and that includes being purified and cleansed, not just forgiven. You know, being forgiven keeps us out of hell, but being purified allows us to enter into heaven. So it makes sense that there exists something in between to get us ready to meet God. You know, it's like the beautiful bride on her wedding day. And remember, we, the church, are the bride of Christ. Now, every bride wants to be ready, to be perfect before seeing her groom. And our groom, the church tells us, is Jesus. So how do we get prepared to meet him? Well, as we said, we need to be not only forgiven, but freed from all earthly attachments which can take our eyes off of God. That's the definition of sin, taking our eyes off of God and putting it on the creature or created thing. Remember, even after we come out of the confessional and our sins are forgiven, we still may have attachment to sin. Yes, Jesus died to forgive that sin, but detaching from that sin is up to us. Suppose, for instance, somebody comes into the confessional and they confess looking at pornography. Now they're sorry and they are forgiven for the sins they have done. But 
There are consequences for willfully choosing to sin. The Bible tells us this. It's like the dad who tells his boy not to play baseball in the yard. He forgives his son for disobeying and breaking the window by playing baseball, but he still disciplines him by grounding him and lovingly correcting the boy. God does the same with us. You know, the Bible makes it clear that when we sin, we scar not just ourselves, but the entire body of Christ. This means our sins are not just private, but we have hurt others, and we must repair that damage. The broken window doesn't just affect the boy. It now affects the whole family who now lacks shelter, for instance. So the boy must repair the damage by paying for it, for example, out of his allowance. A father who doesn't hold his son or daughter accountable for the consequences of their sin, although he forgives them, is not a good father. So we are forgiven in the confessional and the scar is healed, but the wound Um, that we put on the body of Christ may remain until we atone for it. Though merciful, God owes it to his justice not to deliver souls until they have paid their debt. Remember, Matthew 5 verse 25 says, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, so that covers atonement. But what about attachment? All right. Let's go back to the example of the man in the confessional who confessed pornography. He was forgiven by the grace Jesus merited on the cross. But after he is forgiven and walks out of the confessional, he still may be attached to that sin. He still may have the desire to indulge in it. Now, what happens if we die and we still have those attachments? Well, again, Praise God for purgatory. After we've been forgiven for sin by the grace of God, we must still make reparation for our sins as we just explained. But we must also fully detach from any inordinate desires here on earth. We receive temporal punishment in purgatory, and that's like the boy being grounded for breaking the window. But then, like the boy, our time being grounded will come to an end. And we'll be released by our Father who forgives us and loves us. And then we are ready for heaven. You know, although the Father always loved his Son and forgave him, it would not be true love if he didn't hold him accountable for his disobedience. The Bible stresses this. You know, when Moses wasn't obedient to God in the desert, God forgave him, but he still held him accountable and didn't let him enter into the Holy Land. You know, pray and do penance for your loved ones to hasten their release from purgatory. This has been done by Christians since the first century and has always been a tradition in the church. In fact, the second book of Maccabees, which was in the original canon of the Bible, but removed by Martin Luther, not added by Catholics, tells us we need to pray for the dead. The Jews believed it was a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. This is 2 Maccabees, chapter 12, verse 45. You know, although the word purgatory does not appear in Scripture, the revelation of it does. It is the same with the word trinity, which doesn't appear in the Bible either, but the truth of it is revealed in Scripture and is the basis for all Christianity. And this is why on November 2nd, we have All Souls Day. It's a time to pray for those who are still being purified and are suffering in purgatory in preparation for beholding the beatific vision of God. You know, earlier we did a show on the saints mentioning All Saints Day when we honor the souls in heaven. But now on November 2nd, which is the day after All Saints Day, we call All Souls Day, we honor and pray for those souls not quite in heaven. What a great way to be charitable. Why? Because as the founder of our Marian community, St. Stanislaus Papchinsky said, there is no greater act of charity than to pray for the holy souls in purgatory. 
because unlike us on earth, they can no longer help themselves. Only we can help them. Now we call them holy because while they are not yet perfect, they are on their way to heaven. And we call them poor souls because they are still suffering to some extent. They need our prayers. So let's not let them down. Finally, how can we help them? The best way of all is to have a mass said for your deceased loved ones. You can also enroll them in a spiritual benefit society, such as the Association of Marian Helpers, which you can do by calling 1-800-462-7426. Because we pray for the living and the dead every day. Let us pray for your loved ones. So please visit PrayForSouls.org, which is an excellent way to pray for them, to help them, and to get our priests and brothers to help your loved ones as well. So that's a great way. You can also do a plenary indulgence for the faithful departed, which we'll talk about in coming episodes. Or you can even offer up your suffering for them. And everyone has a lot of that. And certainly continue to pray the rosary and the chaplet of divine mercy for them, two powerful forms of devotion that we'll also be talking about more in future episodes. But for now, let's hear a story, in fact, an amazing story, of a woman who had prayed a lot of rosaries and a lot of chaplets, unfortunately, to get through the tragedy that some of you might remember that happened at Virginia Tech. Let's now meet Barbara Laporte. On the corner of Washington and New Milford Avenue in Dumont, New Jersey, sits a memorial park dedicated to Cadet Corporal Matthew Joseph Laporte. April 15th, 2007, was Divine Mercy Sunday. And I remember, of course, praying for my family and friends, but I was especially praying for Matthew. Uh, I felt that he might be not participating as much as I would have liked him in his faith. So I was praying for him. And I remember leaving with, um, I felt calm, peaceful. I felt very, it was very fruitful day for me. The next day, a gunman killed 32 people at Virginia Tech. Matthew charged at the shooter and attempts to save his fellow classmates. When my son died, I said, I could live another 30 years. How do I want to live it? And I had to make a decision. Do I walk towards God or do I blame him for everything that happened and walk away? My son had a military burial. I mean, it was a sea of cadets that were there on a knoll. It was just beautiful, you know. So then you go home. And of course, the questions are always, why? I was reflecting on the fact that I had prayed to Divine Mercy the day before. And we were told by Sister Faustina that we should pray for those that are dying. Well, of course, I didn't know what was going to happen the next day. But I really don't think God cares. And it doesn't matter because he's so outside of time. It doesn't matter when you pray for someone. So I felt that my prayers were there for, for Matthew. So shortly after this, we were fortunate to meet a state trooper who was the first responder to Matthew's classroom, he, uh, senior trooper Gary Chafin. Gary was able to tell us what he saw in that classroom. And he said when he first saw Matthew, he was drawn to him because he was the only one that had a uniform on. So he went by him and he said, I first thought he was faking it because he was smiling. He said he was laying there, smiling, his arms outstretched, the tips of his shoes pointed down, and if you've been shot seven times, how do you lay down in such a straight position? So it took me a while and I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw Divine Mercy coming through the door to greet my son. And I said, that's why he has a smile on his face. So with that, I felt the best way that one could heal would be to forgive. And I forgave the shooter. I just felt that with forgiveness, love, and mercy, that it would be very healing for me. And I think that also lifts a big burden from you, 
and you're free to smile again, you know, to embrace life. I know sometimes in the beginning it's very tough to hear, well, God will draw good out of it. And that just seems a little hollow at the time. And you've lost someone that you cared for very deeply and it's very difficult, but um, I've seen the fruits that have come through. And I think one of the reasons I've been able to see it is I've been able to forgive <clears throat> and I could recognize what God was doing. Barbara commissioned a local artist to paint an image of divine mercy in honor of her son. It was my way of thanking God for being able to forgive and, and you know, to look forward to the rest of my life. Matthew's sacrifice and heroism continues to touch people's lives. Years following his death, he received the Airman's Medal, the highest honor someone in the Air Force can receive for putting their life on the line in a non-combat situation. Recently, Barbara and her family were presented with an honorary plaque from the Perry County Sailors Association. At the ceremony, a rabbi from Talmudic University offered insights into Matthew's sacrifice. The rabbi spoke about how Matthew was a hero, but by saving lives, he was a progenitor of the universes of lives. And then he went on to say, when the Egyptians were, uh, uh, were pursuing the Israelites, they were between the Red Sea and the Egyptians, and they were afraid. And one man was the first one, this is what the rabbi said, to plunge into the Red Sea, and that's what parted it. And supposedly, by, because of his bravery, he was the uh, progenitor of King David down the line. And then the rabbi went on to say that my son wasn't only a hero, he was a king, because a king is a leader who goes before his people and will lead his people. If there's danger, he's going to be first. And I thought that was beautiful. But what I had to comment back to the rabbi was, if you look in Matthew's yearbook, you finally explain to me, and it says, he was probably asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And his reply was to be king. I mean, that's not a coincidence. God put that all together. My words really can't describe what we can't imagine Barbara went through. But you know, her perseverance in praying for the faithful departed is something actually that is scriptural. Now, non-Catholics tell us it isn't, but let's hear in the Bible where it is. On the next day, as by that time it had become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and to bring them back to lie with their kinsmen in the sepulchres of their fathers. Then, under the tunic of every one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge, who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to prayer, begging that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. While some have claimed that praying for the dead is not mentioned in the Bible, this merciful practice is described in 2 Maccabees. Here, Judas Maccabeus asks for prayers and sacrifices on behalf of fallen soldiers who have sinned through idolatry. Scripture says that it was a holy and pious thought to pray for them so that their souls might be prepared for the final resurrection of the dead. Likewise, the early fathers of the church speak of the importance of praying for the dead as a work of mercy, and the most ancient Christian liturgical texts contain many examples of such prayers. As the Catechism sums up, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve that holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Like Judas Maccabeus, 
we can embrace this mystery of mercy by praying for our departed loved ones. Okay, so there we hear from the words of Scripture about the importance of praying for the dead. But let's now hear from the saints as they give us an incredible concept called the Great Exchange, which is something that we can help benefit souls in purgatory, and they can help make us saints. So, once a soul is in purgatory, it sees clearly that because of its sins, it is separated from God. So, the two great pains they have are longing for God and their sorrow for sin. I want you to remember that because it comes real important here in a minute. Longing for God and sorrow for sin. Now, here's what's ironic. And Father Mike Gately wrote about this in his book. Ironically, those two pains, longing for God, sorrow for sins, is actually the signs of holiness in the saints. Indeed, they are. That's why souls in purgatory are saints. Because they have a longing for God and sorrow for sin. The saints all experience great longing for God on this earth and sorrow for their sin on this earth. They were saints because they did it in this earth. Souls in purgatory do it after they die and they're being purified. I hope all of you listening today want to be saints. And this is the surefire way to get there, to have a longing for God and sorrow for sin. So here's the point, everybody. The holy souls have something we want, to be holy by longing for God and sorrow for sins. Now, they have something and we want that, yet we have something they want, our suffrages, our sufferings, because suffering is redemptive. Our, our, our sorrows um, are, are offered up um, fasting. So why not put these two together? This is called the great exchange. Let's ask God for a kind of transfer, spiritual transfer in prayer. This is, this is amazing. Ask God to transfer some of the suffering of the holy souls in purgatory and give it to you. What is that again? Longing for God, sorrow for sins. God will do this because he is happy to relieve the suffering of the souls in purgatory of some of their pain. And he's happy to give you something in the form of grace that will make you more holy. Longing for him more and being more sorry for your sins. In that way, you become more saintly and you become an absolute way to heaven. That is mind boggling. Let's look at the next slide. Lord, you see how terribly the souls in purgatory suffer from their longing for you and from their intense sorrow for their sins. We just talked about this. This is St. Faustina. Well then, in your mercy, I ask you to give them some relief by transferring to my heart, meaning their sufferings, their longing for you and their sorrow for sins. Let my heart burn with longing for you, my God, and please give me a deep contrition for my sins. Amen. Holy mackerel. There is an example of somebody becoming a saint by doing this great exchange with the holy souls in purgatory. Phenomenal. Not only will the souls in purgatory in gratitude pray more fervently for you, but the pain and longing of God and the contrition for sin will help you make become more holy. St. Faustina was one saint that talked an awful lot about the need to pray for the souls in purgatory. She even had visions of it. And let's hear right now as Father Joe Roche reads for us one of those important passages in the diary of St. Faustina.
I asked the Lord, for whom else should I pray for? Jesus said that on the following night, he would let me know for whom I should pray. The next night, I saw my guardian angel, who ordered me to follow him. In a moment, I was in a misty place, full of fire, in which there was a great crowd of suffering souls. They were praying fervently, but to no avail, for themselves. Only we can come to their aid. The flames which were burning them did not touch me at all. My guardian angel did not leave me for an instant. I asked these souls what their greatest suffering was. They answered me in one voice that their greatest torment was longing for God. I heard an interior voice which said, My mercy does not want this, but justice demands it. Since that time, I am in closer communion with the suffering souls. Well, thank you, everybody, again for joining us for this week's episode of Living Divine Mercy. And please stay with us next week as we talk about the source and summit of our faith, the Eucharist. Until then, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.